please people Tell me what kind of woman is this <laughs> Please somebody Please tell me what kind of woman is this You know me so in love with her I don't know which is which Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I don't think that's the way that song goes. Then I was <laughs> well, you know, it's the blues. You can, oh, yeah. move, you can move it around, right? Oh, yeah. It's adaptable. Yeah. The blues is the, it's like the Ford car. I don't care how it have changed since Henry Ford days, but it's still got that Ford right across the front of the back of it there somewhere. When I first met Eric Clapton, Face to face, he, I said, man, that record you made, Strange Brew, I said, that just goes all to my toes. He said, sure, that's your lick. I said, what do you mean, your lick? He said, you listen to that thing you did with Junior Wells. That's where I got it from. So, I, okay. But I didn't let that go to my head and say, oh, Eric Clapton said I, I did that. Now I don't have to play that well no more. Shoot, mm -hmm. man, I got it. And then some of the kids will read it and say, I didn't know who you was until I read what Eric Clapton said. And then I say to myself, oh, shoot, I better go out here and show you I can hit a few licks because what Eric said don't mean nothing unless I can. You, you can tell me you're the best prize fighter in the world, but if I don't see you knock nobody out, you ain't proved it to me. <laughs> you know, so... That's the way I look at my music. When did, you, um, when did you first become aware of music? When did you first pick up a guitar? Oh, my God. Um, uh, my, my parents were sharecroppers. They couldn't afford a guitar. And uh, every Christmas, there was one guy out there in Letchworth, Louisiana. They would go get him, and he would go from house to house, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and that was it until next year. And most of the kids, if they could afford a toy, they was out playing with their toys on Christmas morning. And every time they would drink the gallon of wine and case of beer at each house they went to, the guitar player would take a nap and I would pick up his guitar and, uh, and uh, just bang away at it till I run everybody out of the house. So this guy would come around to everybody's house. That's Christmas. That's what they did in the country. He, you know? He'd get a couple of drinks for coming and playing. With the people at the house, too. All of them would fall out. And then when he passed out? They'd sleep for two or three hours, <laughs> wake up and go to the next house. Yeah. So that's when you first picked up a guitar. How old were you? Uh, must have been about 10, 11, or 12. But I'd seen him before that. Did you know... Um, that first time you picked up a guitar, that this was something you wanted to to do? Yes, because I had been uh, taking rubber bands and stretching them at my ear, and whatever I could drive a nail in a wood wall and take a piece of string or anything, if I could, if I could hear it, I would just bang away at that. But I didn't, you know, I wasn't saying I'm doing this to be a professional guitar player one day because. At that time, you didn't have guitar players. Uh, uh, we didn't have a radio or whatever where I could say, oh, man, if I would learn how to play, I could go places. That was obsolete. And uh, it's just to play the guitar, and I just felt, you know, if I learn how to play the guitar, I'm going to be the only one doing something that can't nobody else do other than that guy that would go get Christmas. And I just was in love with what I heard. And uh, I just followed my mind. For an example, I got a first cousin live in uh, Las Vegas now, and I went out uh, a few years ago, and he walks in with a guitar on his arm. I said, man, and him and I are about the same age. I said, what are you doing? He said, I wish I had to follow you. Yeah. So he just started playing? Uh, I think he just bought it, thought he could, I, I, I think he was thinking he could do it overnight, but you got to... <laughs> You got to put a lot of time in that thing, man. I, uh, I've been fooling with it for quite a while, and it's still a lot I don't know about the guitar. When 
when did you actually get your first guitar? And do you, well, do you remember it? Uh huh. My my dad, uh, that same guy, would come by every Christmas, and they, he loved it to drink. And uh, my dad was so unlogged, if you know. Albert King made a record about the crosscut saw. Two people have to pull that saw. You didn't have the little power saws you got now. Crazy. And my dad was doing that from sun up to sundown, and he gave this guy two dollars for one of those guitars he used to bring by the house. He had two strings on it, and I was the happiest guy in the world. And, I've, I've dedicated my life to the guitar. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know how to play, but one of my records, I played the bass pattern on it. You know, it's kind of similar. But the guitar is the love of my life. And which guitar is, is your favorite? Uh, Defender. At, at the beginning, that uh, when, when you were talking about the two strings my dad had, I, it, 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 I don't think that was heard of until Leo came along with Defender, and I saw the great, one of the greatest guitar players I ever saw came into Baton Rouge when I was about 16 or 17, and he had a, he walks in with this Strat coming in the door playing, and I looked, I said, what the hell is that? You know, I didn't even know what it was, you know, a little solid piece of wood sounding that loud, and I just fell in love then, and what happened was a guy... Who was that? Guitar Slim. Oh, that One was, of the great, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, he made the great record things I used to do, arranged by Ray Charles before Ray made a name for himself. They was hanging in New Orleans and they did all that same label, label Little Richard was with. They was bringing all that out of New Orleans. Do you remember what it felt like to step on stage for the first time? Yeah, how could I forget that? And I cried all night because I was too shy to sing. The guy came and got me, I was pumping gas at a service station. And I would sing a few songs just for you, like in this room, not three people. I, I'd let you know I knew how to play a few licks, but if you take me out outside this door here where 12 people was, I was too shy to say anything. So he came to the service station, and my mother had had a stroke. And he said, he found out how much I was making. He said, I can double that if you just come play Friday and Saturday and Sunday in my band. And I said, okay. And I went to the club that first Friday night, and he plugged me up. And I said, well, I don't have to turn my back to the audience. And the guy said, no way. Did you turn around at all that night? No, he fired me. <laughs> <laughs> so the first gig was like the whole yeah, yeah. The whole, I, the whole show, you had your back to the audience. Uh-huh. And I had a friend of mine who knew I could uh, play well enough to stay there. And he heard about it, and he came to the service station with a bottle of wine. He said, I got some schoolboy scotch, and it would turn you around. Schoolboy scotch is a bottle of wine? Yeah, that's what it was called. Okay. Yeah. He said, if you drink a little So drink, if you have a couple of drinks, you turn then around. you'll be able to turn around. Yeah, and I've been turned around ever since. <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe the feeling of playing music? How, how does it feel? I... I feel like I'm on top of the world if I'm playing and somebody looks happy. And when I go to the stage now, I don't worry about myself. My main concern is whatever you're going to hit, the note or whatever you do, you just look at the expressions on someone's face. And it's like I wrote a song once about, you know, you can tell somebody you love them and you be lying, but if you show them, you can't lie. So I say, let me go out there and see, can I make someone happy? Because if you live in this life, I think we all have a problem one way or the other. If it's not a job, if it's, if it's love life or whatever. And a lot of people listen to the blues now and say it's sad. All blues are not sad. But if you got a little problem and come to me and I can make you forget it for a couple hours, I'll be the happiest man that ever woke up that morning. Did you become a... Uh a different person when you're playing? No. No, I don't think so. You know, I, I'm a happy person when I'm playing. And if I get to the point I'm not happy, I don't think I should go up there and play because I'll be cheating the people who think enough for me to come out to listen to me. Is there anybody inspires you today? I mean, how do you stay? Are you kidding? How do you man? stay inspired? <laughs> All you got to do is listen to B.B. King, man. That guy got a left hand, he vibrates his hand, man, and he don't need no special effects. 
And of course, all these youngsters coming up overnight, man, they're showing me some stuff. I'm like saying, I've had that get down my hand for 50 years, and I hadn't found that note that this little young kid that I'm supporting a lot now, Quinn Sullivan, I, I called him on the stage at uh, seven years old, and I had to unplug the hand because I couldn't believe it. He's amazing. What else keep, keeps you motivated? I mean, obviously, you've, you've been doing this a, a while and you've been very successful. What, what else keeps you motivated to keep wanting to learn? Every time my agent called me and said, hey, I want you to come to Australia, Brazil, and all over the world, and I just light up like a Christmas tree. Because that means I must have did something right for them to call me back because a lot of guitar players are much better than me. Don't even be called. And once in my life, I wasn't being called, you know, and I didn't care because all those greats were still living then, man, you know. When uh, people like Muddy, T-Bone that was living, I didn't care. All I wanted to do was watch them. Well, now people are watching you. <laughs> I'm not that good. They was a natural. I'm just a student. What do you think has changed in, uh, in the blues over the years? I mean, there's been a, a big resurgence, I guess, recently. But if you sort of look at the the music and the art form of the blues, what do you think has shifted since you started playing? They quit playing it on your big FM radio stations. My children didn't know who I was until they got 21. You had to be 21 to come into a blues club. They hadn't heard of a buddy guy on the radio or a television like they do other music, and I don't know why they treated the blues like this, but. We got some hardcore people just like me. When we had all AM stations, they played everything. This jockey could play a jazz, a spiritual, or whatever he wanted. And then you heard Muddy Waters three or four times a week. You heard Howlin' Wolf three or four times a week. You can go for a year now. You might hear one radio at three or four o'clock in the morning and play Hoochie Coochie Man by Muddy Waters at three o'clock in the morning by B.B. King. They just don't play that anymore. They uh, music is like the cars and your cameras or whatever you got. Now, I remember the time, I'm old enough to remember that camera you got on me. Now, a guy had to put his head in a sack to take it. And now, he just said that. And a that, big, big puff of. Yeah. And a big, <laughs> <laughs> so, music is the same way. And these young people now are so creative, man. Every time I hear something, I'm like saying, oh, my God, buddy, all the time you put in there. Look like you should have found that before they did, but that's the way life is, you know, it goes on, it goes on. Mm -hmm. 